Hello subscribers, hello others. David Hoffman, filmmaker with another clip. This is a live presentation you're about to see from 1969, The Police versus the Community. I think in some ways it's gonna really remind you of issues today and in other ways things have changed and improved. So think about the time, 1969, tension in America, violence in America, not street crime so much, anti-war protests by anti-war demonstrators, not hippies, as some of my commentators accuse. They're not hippies, they're anti-war demonstrators. Small group, pretty violent. And then the black community becoming violent as well. After Martin Luther King was killed, the violence really picked up in the inner city black community. The police are the symbols in that society at that time of law and order. Nixon, law and order. And there's an enormous amount of tension. First of all, they're almost all men. They're 99% men, 99% white in the black communities. And they see their job, and I've interviewed cops who've told me this, not as stopping crime, but as keeping order. Very different from stopping crime. In fact, crime rose during that period, and in many ways it was because the police were not on the streets blocking crime, they were making law and order. On the other hand, the police had a job to do. They were caught in the middle. They were doing the job they thought the community wanted. So you're gonna see live on public television, incredible, a live night where police talk to activists and the public is watching. You don't see that anymore, do you? Do you ever see live television of multiple sides of the partisan divide talking to each other, even though the talk is rough? I'm very interested to see what you think about now. For example, things changed. They hired women, they hired black people, they trained in community relations, the police. It's, it's not the same as it was back then, certainly not in my view. How do you see it? White racist policemen. Uh, numerous other things here, if you want me to mention them, we'll say here. Now we've got to put the, get these four-legged and two-legged beasts. We know none of them of the brothers and sisters are going to stand for this dog business. Well, what's the, the motive behind what this sort of, uh, what's the motive behind this sort of propaganda, Mr. Kovaleski? I'll tell you what it is, to stir up the hostility between the police and the members of the minority group. You saw two perfect examples here tonight of why there is hostility toward the police. Just take one good long look at Reverend Klee when he says that we are the enemy, that we are the invader. And he, this is the man that says here that white policemen are the ones who are enforcing the laws for the white power structure. Let what me is ask Reverend Klee going to do Mr. when Kovaleski. he gets, What's Reverend Klee going to do? Mr. Kovaleski, let me ask you a question. Black power no, I'd, like to, I'd, I'd like to know, I'd like to know from Mr. Kovaleski Number one, if he knows of any case in the black community where there are automatic weapons. Do I know of any case? Yes. Wasn't it recently that we just rounded up 15 people in the city of Newark for a, an arsenal of uh, automatic weapons? I don't believe so. You don't believe no, so? No, I, I don't would believe like so. Why don't you read the Newark Evening News? I do, Mr. I do. I read it very closely. Except when you're in there, Mr. Kerbin. I read it very closely. Mr. Kerbin, I would like to ask you a question. I'd like to also ask Mr. I gave you this file here that's filled with hundreds of people that have been locked up for carrying guns recently. I'd like to ask you another question, Mr. Kowalewski. Do you believe that there has ever been a case of police brutality against a black citizen in the city of Newark? Now that all depends on what you consider to be police At brutality. Physical, I'm gonna answer your Physical question. abuse of I'm a citizen in the city. Question. Physical abuse in the city. Now listen, if I was to say that- Do you believe that there has case. ever been a case an well, let me let me tell you one little story. Let Good, me tell I'd you like one little story. Let me tell you one little story, Mr. Kowaleski. There was a woman by the name of Ida Brown. She was arrested by two police officers and charged with assaulting them. In Newark? In Newark. She was Negro. She was brought to trial. In a conversation during the trial, a prosecutor heard these police officers talk about how they had rigged this story against this woman. He removed himself from the case and took the witness stand himself and testified as to what he had heard. The case was dismissed. The interesting thing is that these two police officers have still to today not had charges brought against them for perjury or either departmental charges. I, I would like to ask you a question. Uh, Mr. Kerbin, I'll answer that. I don't know about the departmental charges, but I know that 
As a result of that particular incident... Were, were there police... perjury charges filed against well, these listen, police that's officers? Well, up to the county prosecutor. It's not up to the Newark police. What do you mean it's up to the Newark police? I said it's not up to the Newark police. Let me say this, Mr. Kerbin. To admit that there are... To say that there aren't isolated cases of police brutality would be a bold-faced lie. Uh, number one, in the city of Philadelphia here, a colored man came forward and squealed on RAM. On uh, what, sir? RAM. It's a colored organization. RAM. A revolutionary action movement. movement. Now, this organization had hired him to shoot and kill the police commissioner, the mayor of Philadelphia, and the district attorney of Philadelphia. And he pointed out to the police and to the FBI where the potassium cyanide was stashed away so that when they started the riot, they were going to poison 1,500 policemen. Now, I want to ask uh, this reverend over in Detroit, who is the leader of the colored people in Detroit? Because I have a book here, uh, Reader's Digest, which is a very respected book, and it states that the, the New York Times said that the executive secretary of the NAACP in the city of Detroit condemns the police because they didn't put force into the riot area soon enough. Now, do they want force or don't they want force? Chief Jenkins, can you pull some of these strings together uh, from your well, point of view and, and uh, uh, get some balance out of this discourse? Well, I'd like to say at this point that I regret that more police chiefs did not appear on this program tonight because I don't think they've been well represented. Now, this program, I think, has emphasized that this nation has a very serious problem that we must find the answer to it. Now, the first order of business must always be law and order and justice for all. Now, the causes must be identified and they must be corrected. And that is exactly what we're determined to do here in Atlanta, Georgia. And I'd like for Reverend Williams to speak on that also. Uh, thank you very much, Chief. Uh, I, I've listened to the dialogue which has been going on here, and I, I know that the gentlemen in Newark have some problems, but I don't think we've been talking about what really concerns us. One of the things that I'd like us to get back on, and this is the question of white fear, and the fact that the police department in the city of Detroit is arming itself with the stoner rifle, seems to me to uh, lend support to the claim of the minorities in that city that they have something to fear. Uh, I certainly share the opinion of somebody who said this is not the sort of thing we want in a democratic society. Uh, now, one of the things that we've got to understand is that white citizens do not have the same reason to complain as Negroes do against the police department. Why is that so, Reverend? This is so because policemen do make a difference in the treatment of Negro citizens and whites. Why is that so? That is so because they, be they belong to a majority race of people who in this nation feel that there ought to be a difference made between Negroes and whites. Uh, anybody in his uh, sane mind knows that in America we have made differences between white and Negroes for a long time and the majority of the whites still feel Negroes are inferior to whites and that they ought to be treated differently. Now, Rep anybody, Reverend Williams, yes. time, is, time is running out on us. We're going to get back to you, I hope, but I, I want to go for the, for the moment to Alderman Joseph Clark in St. Louis uh, and uh, get some further reactions from you, Alderman Clark. Uh, yes, Mr. Morgan, I'm wanted to get in here before we destroy ourselves with guns and bullets. Uh, I would like to say that I think that uh, in co police community relations, we must realize that this is just one way that the two races system in America reveals itself. And I think that too often the hostility that Negroes have against white people in general is reflected in their attitude toward police. And I know that too often the hostility that whites have against Negroes is reflected in the white policeman's attitude toward Negroes. And that generally white people sit back and let the police handle their end of this battle. And I would like to ask your distinguished panel there in New York, how can we mobilize the majority race in America to remove some of the injustices against the Negro people? 
I think that it's very important that the, uh, the commun community have something to say about police operations, and perhaps this is a basic problem. Uh, the community, particularly the black community, has never had anything to say about police function or how policemen uh, treat them uh, in their own communities. For instance, uh, why does the black community have to put up, say, with racist policemen? Why don't they have the right to say, we don't want this racist policeman who calls our children nigger working in our community? Why can't they expel that policeman? It seems that this is a right uh, of the white community. The Negro community has to put up with this type of thing because they don't have any power. Uh, I want to go for a moment to uh, Reverend Clegg's uh, congregation in Detroit and ask Reverend Clegg if I can still get him uh, nobody, I think, uh, Dr. Clegg, would uh, deny that there is a struggle in this country. Uh, can you still hear me? All right, let's go. Okay. We are through with this white hypocrisy, with the efforts of white people to set up a situation that they can control. We are tired of sociologists and psychologists talking us to death. We are tired of police commissioners and police experts telling us that we're not getting our heads whipped. We are through. The black revolution is in progress, and it's going on, and we don't care what kind of gun they Dr. Have. Poussaint, as a psychiatrist... They can't stop it. I don't care what they do, it's going on. There's nothing they can do. Dr. We'll stop it. Dr. Poussaint, as a psychiatrist, we are, we are I don't do want you to, to put uh, right, now, the reverend on a couch, so to speak, but I would like you to address yourself to just what he said. Well, I think uh, the Reverend Clegg, like uh, many other black people in this country, uh, are very angry uh, because they're not listened to uh, the, the charges and other problems that they bring to the establishment uh, are continually uh, brushed aside, uh, that there really isn't any dialogue. The uh, police community relations programs generally are not a two-way type of dialogue. They're public relations programs where the police try to sell uh, their self-image as they're trying to do tonight, uh, that group in Philadelphia, and that there's, there's no admission on their part or bending that there's a problem uh, that they have to uh, deal with. There's a tendency, if you talk about the population as a whole and how do the police behave toward them, to ignore the fact that it tends to be concentrated in the ghetto. And in many ways, the slum precinct is like the slum school. It doesn't get the best of the police department. And indeed, there is probably the least dialogue at that level of the community. Uh, our department in Philadelphia has had a community relation program going on for many, many years. And in my opinion, it's a waste of time because we have to put up with people like Rep Brown, Carmichael, and people such as that. You can't now, we pick the members of, your, of, of a... Of a country that's got 200 million people in it, Mr. Well, Harrington. You have well, to deal with like them as they come. I would like to say something in defense of policemen, if you would let me say it. Now, you bounced all around the country. You know, we policemen are not responsible because people riot on account of what their educational problem is, if they're not getting a proper education. We policemen are not responsible because people are not getting jobs and getting paid big salaries. We policemen are not uh, responsible for a lot of things. We policemen didn't send Carmichael over to the other side to damn and curse this country and ask for it to be defeated. We didn't ask Rep. Brown to demand that the American flag be taken off the stage before he'd talk. But if trouble starts, we would have to stop it. And I say to you that I think we have bent too much. And I think it's time for reason in this country, not treason. What, what sort of reason do you mean, Mr. I Harrington? I think that people such as you, now you have bent over backwards all night just to try to rectify the ones who are going to walk out. Now, we had every reason in the world to walk out on you tonight because you refused to let us get our say in on many of these things. Now, you've got the experts there. You've got the experts who was on the President's Crime Commission. Well, let's hear how they would handle a riot Let's see what they would do if they had to go into a riot area. What would they do with their clubs? Where would they be? And let me say this to you. With all of the experts, I hope the people in this country remember that last year, crime went up 15% over what it was last year. And it's only the decent people that crime is being committed on by hoodlums. And it's only one thin line between crime and society, and that's us policemen. 
Uh, I have to agree with Mr. Harrington because uh, these ghettos, the conditions that exist in them, like uh, unemployment, rundown housing, and several other causes, were not caused by the police. And the policemen that on the beat there didn't ask to be put in that specific place. But when we took an oath, we took an oath to preserve law and order, not to go around fostering community services because we have our hands full with law and order. Now, I am completely flabbergasted at the gentleman, if I should call him a gentleman, in Detroit with what he is preaching. I was always told that ministers of the gospel were supposed to preach love. Now, here is a man positively preaching hate. Now, I'm beginning to wonder whether he is a minister of Christ or a minister of Satan. What has happened is that uh, we have reduced this dialogue to uh, the question, whose side are you on, our side or their side? Now, that statement of the case is entirely irrelevant and beside the point, and if American society accepts it as the terms and condition of the, a, a addressing the problem, then our future is very dim indeed. I'm inclined to believe that our concern with the police this evening is not to burden them with the responsibility for the whole of the problem, but rather to suggest the sense in which a sensitive regard for their role in addressing the tasks to which they are assigned will indeed minimize in some degree the kind of tensions which are rampant in the society between the various groups. And it is important that we make certain that in their input, they do not further aggravate the situation. Not that they cause it, but it's mighty important, terribly important, that we see to it that the police actually give us the time in terms of which we can resolve these basic issues of We're our democracy. We're prisoners of time. The total community, and I, I speak primarily now to the white community, it must begin to work at changing the basic attitudes in our nation. And until that is done, uh, make the police department as good as you will, we shall not remove by doing that the causes of riots in this nation. We're a pluralistic society, and people ought to be encouraged in difference and in expression of that difference, and there ought to be a way to compose those differences without these kinds of confrontations. I'd like to see the police abandon this dead dog they've been beating about the police review board. I don't happen to be one that was ever in favor of it. In fact, I've been publicly against it as a solution of our problems, simply because I didn't think it got to the root of the problem, namely the developing of confidence of the public in the way in which the police addressed the claims and protests about grievances. But I do think the police ought to take seriously into, uh, into their minds the possibility of developing confidence on the part of all the sections of the public by, in their own way, experimenting in developing channels by which grievances can be presented to them accepted without prejudice, processed in a responsible way, and an accounting and an answer made available to those who protest, protested. And if that is done, then the, many of these things will put aside that they now have occasion to take an objection to on their merits as having no warrant. But to simply say it isn't so is not going to be an answer to these people. They are aggrieved.